Hi everybody, my name's Steve and uh, I'm just going to do an, an introduction to my new library that I've published called SPUD, um, which stands for Steve's Persistent Unreal Data. So I'm trying to solve the problem of persistence with Unreal and the most basic version of that is to save and load games. So I wanted an easy system where I could opt in any of my classes so that uh, when I save my game their state gets saved and I can load that back in again and it will come back exactly as it was. So let's just demonstrate that to begin with. So let's say there's a bomb over here that if I destroy, or a cube over here, let's use this one here. Let's just shoot that one off the top there. That's over there now. And if I save my game, and then I go over here, and let's say blow up a few more things, and then I load, I'm back again. My character is back where it was. I can look at the uh, square that I knocked off the top there and the bomb that was over here is gone. So it's remembered everything uh, that I told it to. So that's one reason for persistence. Another reason is when you're wandering around levels, when your player is transitioning between levels or uh, if you're using streaming levels, so um, that's when you've got po portions of your level unloading and reloading as you walk around. Whenever things are unloaded and reloaded, whether it's a full map or whether it's uh, a streaming section of a map, you're going to want to make sure that anything that you've changed in that area or in that map um, is remembered and that when you come back to that map or walk back to the area where the streaming level comes back, um, that all of the state that you had, again, is restored to what it was, even if you haven't actually performed a, a save game. Because obviously, if you walk away from this area, so let's do this again. Um, let's just actually let's do this. And then let's walk over here. Now this is actually a streaming level transition over here. You can see in the top left, I've got a report of which levels are loaded. Currently it's only this cube arena. Uh, everything else is unloaded. And if I actually just unpossess my character for a second, peek over this rise, you can see there's nothing here right now. But if I go back into my character and just peek over the rise, you'll see top left, uh, the target range has been loaded and here it is. And all of these things have some state as well. So let's just give them a little bit of, whoop, okay, hit a bomb there as well. Um, so two, three, three. So I go back over this rise and that will unload again. And again, if I pop over just to show you, whoops, um, in unpossessed mode, the level is gone. So without spud, all of those objects would potentially have just lost all their state because they've just been unloaded. They don't exist anymore. But using spud, I pop over this rise again and the level will get reloaded and you can see all of those objects are exactly as they were. The bomb that was there has been is still destroyed um, and all of those objects have got the state that they had before. So that's basically what Spud is doing. It's making sure that all of the objects that you've opted in to this system um, remember the state that they need to remember. And um, it even remembers... So actually if I reload this, but go back to where I was, so before I did this, if I hit this bomb and save it while the cubes are in motion like so and if i reload it you see it remembers all of the momentum as well uh, i haven't actually opted in the particle systems to uh to saving and loading so actually the bomb is just gone um and you know technically i saved it at the point where the particle system was still happening but because i, have, I didn't opt in the particle system to saving um only the the cubes and, and the bomb sort of responded to that uh, and also the character does as well so if i if i go up here for example and just jump off and then save in the middle of a jump there we go and then if i reload that you'll see i still have the momentum that i had uh, during the save game so there's a bunch of things that it sort of does on its own um, and then there's a bunch of things that you can basically enable to decide which bits of your state that you want uh, to be saved so um, this example level, by the way, is linked in the uh, GitHub repository for the library itself. So if you want to check it out and see how it's working, you can do that. But I'll just go through a few things to give you an idea of how easy it is to opt in to the system. So let's take the cubes, for example. Those are the, those are the simplest ones. Um, so let's just quit this for a minute. So if I go to the cube class, now this really doesn't have anything in, in, anything in it at all. It's just a, basically a static mesh actor. The only thing I've done is in my class settings here, um, interfaces, I've implemented the interface spud object. 
And that's literally all I had to do. I don't have to implement any methods on that. Uh, I literally just have to put spot object as an interface on this object, and then immediately it's effectively uh, stateful and persistent. Now in C++, um, it's also very easy. All you have to do is add on the iSpot object to your list of uh, derived classes that effectively is implementing that interface. Um, and again, that's all you have to do. There's no reason to uh, add any methods to that. Um, later on, we'll talk about using some optional ones, some optional callbacks, but to get this entire object um, opted into persistence and being saved, uh, all you have to do is effectively uh, add this little clause onto the end of your inheritance in C++. Now, the basics that it will remember are its position, uh, it will remember its physics uh, momentum, so if it's flying through the air it will remember that. Um, if it's a pawn, this one isn't obviously, but if it's a pawn and it's player controlled, uh, then it will remember its orientation, like the controller rotation. Um, actually, sorry, even, even if it's controlled at all, even by AI, it will remember the uh, controller rotation. Um, also, objects that have movement components. Um, so that, that includes, let's just, uh, you saw that happen with the uh, the player. So my player character has a movement component and that's actually what's giving it the momentum when it's reloaded. Also the projectiles. So if I save while the projectiles are going, oh, I hit that, um, and then reload, you'll see they retain their momentum. Uh, and again, those projectiles have a projectile movement component and SPUD detects that and makes sure that the velocity is, is maintained on, on reload. So those are kind of the basics you get for free. If you want to save additional things, so the bomb has a countdown, for example. So this property here is tagged as save game. And you can do that in C++ as well using the save game attribute on, on U property. Uh, I have that in C++ as well here for example so this u property says blueprint read only but also save game so this means this score um which is currently on the game instance i'll, sh I'll show you how that works in a minute um that is also being maintained that's another way to opt in a property so anything that's a u property or a property in blueprints uh having that save game flag means that that property will be saved and loaded um as part of the spud state uh, and that's kind of it. Now, the only thing that you do sometimes need to do is you might have some derived data. So this countdown, if it's already started, um, there are things that happen when the bomb is triggered, including setting up uh, a sound event and also setting up the material flash, which you can sort of see going on here. Um, now, rather than store absolutely everything, well, rather than trying to like persist every single minute aspect um, of the object. I only want to really want to store the things that are needed to uniquely identify the state of the object and then anything derived from that, so whether or not the material is flashing or whether the audio is, is playing for example, um, I want to be able to base that on that restored property. So the way you can do that is um, by having events and in addition to the iSpot object interface, there is a spot object callback uh, as well, which is an optional one that you can add. And adding that gives you access to a few more events which happen on your object. Um, so if I look at my interfaces over here, you can see under spud, uh, there's a bunch of events that happen. And one of these is post restore. So that's just after the object has been restored to its previous state. I, I use restore and store rather than save and load because save and load implies writing to a file um, and you're not always doing that. Spud is, tries to be efficient um, and only restores or stores bits of the level that are going out or coming in when there's streaming levels. So uh, you don't have to necessarily persist all of that to disk at this point. Uh, it often can be more efficient to have it just going in and out of a, a, a memory database of, of objects within your level, for example. So that's why it use, uses store and restore rather than save and load. Um, so post restore happens after the object has been restored. So all of the standard stuff has happened. All of the properties have been restored. It's in the right position. The physics is, is set up. Um, but uh, we get an opportunity to do some additional work after that before effectively it starts playing. So in this case, post restore, I'm I know my countdown has already been restored to its state uh, as at uh, the save game or or uh, paging back in, for example. Um, so I just do my quick test to see is the countdown over zero. If it is, um, then I'll start my countdown effects as well in exactly the same way as I would have done um, if I'd walked into the objects. To trigger it as usual. So this just lets you do things to make sure they kind of resume from where they left off without necessarily storing absolutely every derived value um, in your save game.
So that's how you uh, opt in your objects into the SPUD system so that they remember their state. I should just mention that there's a difference between level objects and global objects. So the most obvious case is you've got levels, you, sorry, you've got objects in your level. Um, and the way that SPUD finds those is just by, like, a, like I mentioned before, uh, adding the iSPUD interface. And that's enough. As long as your uh, object is in the level, uh, SPUD will find it because it will scan through levels, and that includes streaming levels as they load and un unload. Uh, so those objects will be found. And that includes uh, game modes, game states, anything that really is attached to a level. Now, there may be other objects that you want to persist. Um, for example, a game instance might have a bunch of global data, maybe a top level top level state that you want to store or any other kind of structures that you want um, to maintain that are at a higher level than your levels. Um, my example here is the score. So you can see the score at the top there. Um, the score is just incremented when I hit one of these targets, as you can see. And if I save my game there with my score is six and I change the score up to say 13, then I restore it. Not only has the uh, individual object state returned to what it was, but also my score up in the top right there um, has also reverted to its previous value. And that score is actually stored in the game instance. Now the game instance wouldn't normally be found as part of the spud persistence because it's not actually attached to a level. So simply adding the interface to it won't do anything. Um, you actually have to explicitly opt in global objects to being stored alongside all your other data uh, from your levels. That's very easy to do. Um, all you really have to do is, I'll show you a C++ version, but it's, it's available in Blueprints as well. So I have a game instance here, and you can see I haven't actually derived from iSpot object because I don't need to, because it's not getting discovered automatically um, in the level. Um, however, any U object will can still be stored in, in SPUD. Um, so in this case, I have a U property, um, which is, oh, no, sorry. A new property here which is set to uh, save game i actually referenced this earlier and all i do to make sure that that gets included in the state is during the initialization of the game instance um, i get the spud system um, that you need to pass it a world object if you're doing this in blueprints you just have to do just type get spud system uh, and then i'm adding a persistent global object uh, with a name and i'm adding this and I'm just giving it a name. Uh, that's just like a key in the database, effectively. You don't necessarily have to do that explicitly. There are ways that it can figure that out for itself. Um, but I prefer, in this case, for global objects, you just to use an, ex an explicit name. It's just easier to make sure that it's always the same, because this is effectively a singleton. Um, there's only ever going to be one. The only important thing about global objects is they have to always exist. Um, SPUD will not uh, recreate any of these things. So uh, if you opt the object in, it just has to exist at the time that the restore happens. Um, so because this is a game instance, uh, it will always definitely exist while the game is running. So I can just opt it straight in. And every time the game loads, it will, in addition to restoring anything that's attached to a level, it will also go and repopulate any of the uh, properties that are marked as save game on this game instance as well, which is what that score is doing. I guess the only other thing to tell you is uh, the volumes that I'm using, the streaming volumes. So um, the one caveat with SPUD is that when you're loading and unloading streaming levels, it kind of needs to know about that. Um, and the events in Unreal don't necessarily give you quite enough information to do that by default. So SPUD has its own API, kind of a wrapper around the streaming um, streaming load and streaming unload. Um, it also makes it slightly easier because you can just basically request a, a level to be loaded or withdraw a request for a level and SPUD maintains like a reference count of how many times it's been requested and unrequested and make sure it unloads at the right time, um, which is fairly easy to use. But to make sure that uh, the easiest way to use uh, streaming systems is to use streaming volumes, you can use blueprints as well to trigger them at various times. And if you did that, you would call the spud streaming api but if you don't if you just want volumes you can use the ones that i provided and you can see them here actually um so this one here is covering the whole of that level and this one here is covering like the transition between the two and this one actually loads both of these levels so that if you're anywhere in this area then both of these levels are loaded um and if you overlap with both of them, that's fine. It's just effectively an extra request. And it's only when both of them uh, are withdrawn that the level unloads again. Um, so 
this is a spud streaming volume rather than a standard level streaming volume uh they're very very similar you just place them in a level as normal set their their size um and position um the only difference is it's a bit easier to set them up so uh in the original level streaming volumes you have to then go over to the levels tab um and start using this tiny little button here to uh make the level reference the volume which always felt really backwards to me so while i was doing this because i had to make these streaming volumes call the spud streaming system anyway um i made it a bit easier so you don't have to do that with these you just drop it in set the size and then in this list here which is normally read only in in the level streaming volume that comes with unreal you can just pick your levels that you want uh this volume to request a load of and in this case this one here requests both sides like i said just to make sure that they're both loaded uh whereas what this one over here for example only requests that one which is this side. So um, these volumes then nicely load uh, in and out these uh, individual pieces of the level, and that gives the spud system enough notice that it can make sure that the object's state is saved before it's unloaded and immediately after it's loaded that the state is restored again so everything comes back. Okay, so I guess that's all ready to say for the moment. Um, thanks to Mary for my wife Mary for this uh, nice little spud potato print model. I thought that was a good logo. Um, check out uh, the GitHub repository. It's still fairly early days, but I'm I'm quite happy the way it's going. It's it's pretty solid. Uh, I've got a few more tweaks to do, a few more optimizations and options and things. But other than that, it's it's working pretty well. Um, like I say, this example project is linked in the documentation. It's a separate GitHub repository so that you don't get your own uh, project cluttered with it if you just want to use the library but um, if you check out the example itself that will also check out a sub module of, of the library um, and you can just see how all this stuff is working um, and hopefully you'll find it useful in your projects as well okay thanks very much <laughs>